So thanks for joining us in yet another um, episode and another adventure into the, the scriptures. Um, we're very grateful that we have this opportunity every week and uh, it's a privilege to serve you in this respect. Um, we are in a, a, a day where we're uh, celebrating uh, our um, service persons and uh, it's uh, around Memorial Day and we're uh, wanting to take that opportunity to give consideration to a, uh, a number of passages of scripture that are not often visited. Um, we're wanting to look at uh, in, the, in the Bible, both Hebrew Bible or, or Old Testament and New Testament, how we are confronted with a, a need to uh, um, come to grips with the fact that uh, the God who is presented there is both a God of peace and a God of war. So does God have to choose between those two? And do we have to choose between those two? This is an important point because it uh, finds place in both Old and New Testament, and it also um, directly imp impacts our lives. How, um, uh, how are we supposed to, to live our lives as those who want to be imitators of God, those who want to uh, walk in his ways and reflect his character? So um, the majority of, of sermons in, uh, uh, and Sunday school lessons or home Bible studies, um, whatever form your study of scripture might take, um, have focused on uh, primarily on the aspect of God as Prince of Peace, um, as, uh, Jesus as a peacemaker, um, a, a, and the like. And so what we want to do to, in order to balance uh, that uh, perspective out is to look at the other side of the coin as well. And I'm hoping that you would uh, benefit from that uh, more balanced approach to um, resolving these issues. Um, should uh, we attempt to reconcile uh, one uh, aspect, characteristic of God's nature um, to, the, um, uh, to the detriment or damage of the other? Uh, I would uh, argue, and, and I think that scripture does as well, that no, there, we have to go with the both and. We need to um, kind of uh, discipline ourselves, um, humble ourselves, and allow the Word of God to speak wherever it might lead us. What, whatever direction it goes, we want to move with it. Um, if, as the Scripture is speaking of God as a God of peace, a God of reconciliation, a God of mercy, forgiveness, compassion, etc., we need to go with that, and we need to embrace that aspect of the message of Scripture. The other side is when the Bible speaks of God as being our um, heavenly parent, we need to be aware that uh, parenting um, has within it both the aspects of nurture and discipline. Uh, in this area, we need to be aware that uh, God is at times both a God who is actively engaged in opposing evil, and at the same time, God is still a God who wants to bring personal peace and peace to this world. So it doesn't have to be an either or. Uh, the healthy place, we're going to argue, is that there is a both and there for us. Uh, a, a twofer, a, a full meal deal. In this study, that's the, exactly the approach that we're going to take. We're going to attempt to let the scripture speak and lead us in the direction that it wants us uh, to go. So let's uh, take a look at the, the God of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. The Bible says that in Judges 6 that um, uh, Gideon, the judge, uh, built an altar and named it Yahweh Shalom. Yahweh is peace, or the peace of Yahweh. At the same time, though, um, we hear very often in the Bible 
this phrase used referring to God, Yahweh or the Lord of hosts. The Hebrew that lies behind that, Adonai Tzvaot, the word Tzvaot means the Yahweh of armies. Um, and we hear it first in 1 Samuel chapter 1, when um, is, uh, Samuel's father went up every year uh, to worship at, at uh, Shiloh, to worship Yahweh of hosts at Shiloh. It's the first time that that phrase ever shows up in the Bible, but after 1 Samuel 1, it literally shows up dozens and dozens of times. So in this, in this very slide here, we see the Bible presenting um, the nature of God, the character of God, as being very variegated, very diverse, that he has this aspect of his nature that is both Yahweh of peace and Yahweh of armies. Uh, of Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, and again, we're focusing on that other side of the coin that doesn't, quite honestly, doesn't often get uh, much screenplay. Um, in our pulpits and lecterns uh, and on Christian TV and in Christian um, uh, uh, discipleship materials, uh, printed materials today. Um, Jesus says, don't think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword and to set every man against his brother, etc. Why is this? Because truth oftentimes does separate, does divide. Um, this is a passage that some people may not even know is in the Bible, quite honestly, but there it is in Matthew chapter 10 and on the lips of Jesus. And yet there's the other side. In the Gospel of John chapter 14, Jesus says to us, peace I leave with you, my peace I am giving to you, and it's not as the world gives, but this is God's, this is Jesus' peace. So don't let your heart be troubled, don't let it be fearful. Um, so which is it? Is it Matthew 10 or is it John 14? My answer personally would be yes, absolutely. It's Matthew 10 and it's John 14 and lots of other passages that indicate that this is the nature of, of the incarnate in the flesh, Jesus, in the same way that it was the, um, uh, the God of the Hebrew Bible, the God of the Old Testament, we would call it God our call him God the Father at that point. The same two aspects included within the same being, in the same nature. Then of us, um, the Bible will give the both and the and, both sides. Paul says in Romans 12, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Then the other side of it is, and this is the same author, this is Paul the Apostle writing in 1 Timothy 5. And the same writer that said, be at peace with all men, says, if anyone doesn't provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And let's just dive into this particular word um, at this point, the word provide. It shows up as you see on the, on the screen at the bottom in the footnote, in a number of passages in the, um, in the New Testament, as well as in places in Greek literature outside the Bible. So you'll find, for example, in Acts 24, that providing is taking care of political needs. In Romans 12 and 13, uh, as well as in 2 Corinthians 8, you find a, a very variegated use of this word, and it basically ends up meaning making, taking forethought for, making plans for, uh, preparing for any uh, eventuality, any need, whether that is social or psychological, whether it's physical in terms of physical needs, whether it's a need for safety or, or security, that kind of, it, it, it's an all-inclusive thing. And so when Paul is speaking in First Timothy, he's saying that uh, those who are responsible for the care of households have a responsibility, yes, to punch the clock and to bring a check home every week, but also has a responsibility to make sure that, uh, that they're properly clothed, make sure that they're properly fed with a proper diet, make sure that they have uh, the proper social interactions, and also 
are safe and secure uh, as members of that household. So Paul is on both sides of this when he's applying um, it to the followers of God um, in, the, um, in the New Testament. Further, when you look at the book of Psalms, and we're just now giving some examples all over the Bible, um, in the book of Psalms, you find the psalmist saying in Psalm 120, I am for peace. And yet, just a few Psalms later, Psalm 144, blessed be Yahweh, my rock, who trains my hands for war, and in a beautiful Hebrew poetic parallelism, trains my hands for war, and also trains my fingers for battle. So which is it? Is it is it peace or is it preparedness to go to war when need be? Yes, it's both and. I'm hoping that you're picking up as we page through these slides, whether it's Yahweh, God the Father of the Old Testament, Jesus in the Gospels, um, speaking to uh, the Bible, speaking to us in the letters of Paul, whether it's the Psalms here, that we're getting the same both and everywhere throughout Scripture. So while some would argue this is a contradiction, uh, you can't have both. Uh, well, I would argue, yeah, you can have good and evil in the world. You can have light and darkness in the world, and you can have included within the same uh, person, the same person's nature, uh, the both and, uh, not the either or. Uh, the teacher of wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes starts chapter three out like this. There's an appointed time for everything, and there's a time for every event under heaven or every situation or context under heaven. And then when he gets down to verse eight, he says, there is a time for war and there is a time for, for peace. Similarly, he will say in the same passage, there's a time to embrace and there's a time to refrain from embracing. I guess we maybe learned a whole new nuance of, of, about that as we've gone through COVID-19. Pause for laughter, none, so we move on. Um, let's take a look, let's just do some surveying of first the Hebrew Bible and then move on through the other sections of scripture looking more carefully at this matter of war and peace. Um, it, doesn't the Bible say in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill? Notice you have this in two different places and not one. In Exodus 20, I guess maybe that's the better known version of the Ten Commandments, but you may remember that those people that, that were present there, not the children, but the adults, ended up dying in the 40 years in the wilderness. And so Moses has to reiterate, repeat this in Deuteronomy chapter 5 for this up and coming, this new generation that's about to go into the land of Israel to possess it, into the land of Canaan that would become the land of Israel. So in Deuteronomy 5, we get it again, thou shalt not kill. Notice I've quoted there the uh, the author authorized version, the King James Bible, and it seems to be pretty straightforward. You're not supposed to take life that is precious because it's created in the image of God. And yet, the, um, uh, the, the English is, and especially when you're dealing with a, a matter as, as important as, as this one, and especially because you have, take a look at the top of the slide, you have other uh, Bible translations that read significantly differently on this really important passage. Notice that the passage is the same, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, but the New American Standard reads, you shall not murder. So is it a more generic and a more general prohibition forbidding the taking of any human life, as in the King James, thou shalt not kill? Or is it as the NAS and lots of other more modern translations reading that you shall not murder? Well, we have to give final recourse to the original language of scripture. And this is just one of the reasons why I've given my life to and other people give their lives to the study of the 
the original languages of scripture. So let's take a look at what the, how this was originally revealed uh, 34 centuries ago at Mount Sinai. Uh, kind of get yourself into the, into the mindset. You're there now. You're standing there and you're hearing directly from God what exactly is said. The Hebrew reads, lo tirzach, and the root there is r t s which we don't have in in english but r t s and then the h sound on the end lo tirzach um it means uh in uh hebrew that you should never do something and that root ratzach what exactly does that mean so this gives us an opportunity we're going to have to we're looking at is the King James correct, or are the, the, all the modern translations that read don't murder correct? Is it don't kill or don't commit murder? This is a great opportunity for us to take a deep breath, step back a second, and then start surveying the Bible, uh, putting the, the, the time-tested um, interpretive principle of scripture interpret scripture into actual practice. We hear this parroted, repeated often in Bible college, in seminary, at church, uh, in um, context where we're studying the Bible. But it, it, this principle, it's a method of interpreting the Bible that is often um, misunderstood uh, by people, even the people who say it. And so what we want to do is we want to give it an example of scripture interpret scripture. It's basically looking at various passages of uh, scripture that address the same issue or theme or using the same language um, in order to understand the passage whose meaning seems to be unclear. So it's letting the clear inform our understanding of the less clear. And the less clear would be, is it don't kill or is it don't murder in the Ten Commandments? And let's take so take let's take a look at uh, the uh, at at various passages of Scripture that use this language that use the, that root ratzach, and see if we can come up with a way um, to more carefully fine tune our understanding of that uh, Hebrew phrase. Lo tirzach, do not kill, do not ever kill, or is it do not ever murder? Uh, in the book of Numbers, chapter 35, we read, if a man pushed his brother, his fellow, uh, out of hatred or threw something at him, lying in wait, and as a result he died, or if he struck him down with his hand in enmity or hatred, um, anger, and, and as a result he died, then the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. Here the Hebrew is not that root ratzach, it's a different word, yumat, from, from the root mut. Um, uh, he is a murderer, that person will be put to death, is supposed to be executed because he is a rotzeach. That's, you hear the same three letter sound, R T S and ch at the end. That person is a rotzeach from the root ratzach, and that means that this person has intentionally taken the life of some, someone who is uh, lying in, uh, 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 by lying in wait and with, in, uh, uh, with some kind of premeditation or intentionality attached to it. The blood avenger shall put the murderer, the rotzeach, to death, um, uh, yamit, a different word, when he meets him. So you have two different deaths occurring here with two completely different Hebrew words behind it. One, to execute using the root mut. The other, using the word ratzach in Hebrew to indicate that uh, the, the murderer is to be put to death. This is a really fascinating passage because we've got the, the two different you know, aspects of, yes, in both someone dies, but in one, the, in one instance, the person is, has co committed premeditated murder of the innocent by lying in wait. The other is 
um, executing, putting to death the person for committing premeditated murder. In the book of Judges, um, this is a, uh, a fascinating passage that I'd encourage you, all of these passages, in fact, to study on your own. Uh, maybe go back through the, the video, uh, go, with the, um, uh, go with the PowerPoint version and use this as a, a jumping off point to do your own study. Um, Judges 20 uh, describes the, uh, the uh, rape and murder of a uh, woman and uh, it says of uh, this uh, person who, who experienced this loss. So the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, so she wasn't, wasn't just like killed in battle, wasn't uh, uh, executed for some crime against the community or whatever, but she, this, this person was um, murdered. Um, and there, that is the passage, the verb ratzach yet again. Um, and so please study that on your own and take time to consider each of these uh, passages in greater detail than this quick survey. First Kings chapter 21. Uh, and this has to do with the murder of a man who had a vineyard that the king Ahab and the queen Jezebel wanted to appropriate for their own royal estate. And uh, the question of uh, to put to Ahab and Jezebel, have you murdered they murdered this man in order to take his property. And the root there again is Ratzach. Have you murdered then and then also taken that person's property for your own possession? In the book of Job, the murderer, there again is that Hebrew word Rotzeach. The murderer arises at dawn. He kills the poor and the needy, those who are the most vulnerable, those who are in need of, um, of, of care, of protection. He operates like a, a thief at night. So there you have this, this word, that root R, T, S, and the H sound, Ratzach. That word is, is attached to people who are committing crimes, who are um, committing acts of violence against the vulnerable, the innocent, uh, the needy. Um, here in Hosea, as raiders wait for a man. These are people who are lying in ambush. This is premeditated. So a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem, a holy city. Um, and the word there for murder again is that word ratzach. Surely they have committed a crime. So again, there is this difference between some of these words, more generic words for to, uh, to kill, to execute, to um, put to death in battle and that kind of thing, as opposed to um, uh, these, uh, this, this crime of murder. In the book of Jeremiah, will you steal, murder, the root ratzach again, and commit adultery and swear falsely and offer uh, sacrifices to the pagan god Baal or Baal and walk after other gods. And then the, at the end of this passage in verse 10, he says, uh, you're doing all of these abominations. These are things that are contrary to the nature and the will of God. And we, there we have yet another example of our root ratzach. So the, the Ten Commandments and going back, we're circling back to our original start with this phrase in the Ten Commandments, lo tirzach. In Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5, that thou shalt not or lo, uh, lo tirzach, you shall not, whatever ratzach means, is a prohibition of premeditated murder of the innocent, as we find in uh, the NASB and uh, other more recent translations. This is what is being prohibited or forbidden in the law of Moses in the Ten Commandments. There are other words for taking life that are used, and they get uh, pretty significant use in the Hebrew Bible. The root uh, mut, as shows up in words like hemit, we saw that, uh, a more of generic killing like harag, katal, nacha, etc., smiting, striking, 
um, striking down, that sort of thing. There are words other than Ratzach in the Bible. Here are two really important points, though. I want you to focus on this uh, because th this is, it kind of pulls everything together. Um, it, whenever execution uh, or some kind of generic like killing in battle or whatever is taking place, um, putting someone, uh, killing someone in defense of uh, the, uh, the needy, the, the vulnerable, the word Ratzach never shows up in those contexts. Ratzach is, it is reserved for contexts that are the forbidden taking of innocent life by a premeditated act and for one's own benefit. Um, these words in the Hebrew Bible are never confused. So when execution and generic killing are, um, uh, are in view in the Bible, <clears throat> the root ratzach n is never used. It's these other words that are, uh, that are used instead. Also, looking at it from the other side of the coin, um, these words for execution and generic killing are never employed in the Hebrew Bible or in the Old Testament um, when, uh, when taking life is, it, it, uh, when there's a prohibition like in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, uh, when God is forbidding um, uh, killing, uh, he's forbidding the taking, the, 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 the uh, premeditated taking of innocent life. Um, those generic words are never used. It's always that root ratzach. So the Hebrew Bible is making a very clear distinction between these two different kinds of taking of life. And it even boils down to, it, it goes all the way down to the granular level of what words are being chosen by the authors of scripture uh, to describe this taking of life. One that is, uh, uh, that is allowed, the other that is absolutely prohibited and forbidden under any circumstances ever. In fact, uh, the reality of it is that using these words other than Ratzach, God actually sometimes commands the taking of life. And for example, in battle, and I've listed a bunch of Bible passages there, uh, you're welcome again to continue your study of this on your own, um, but I'm sort of synopsizing a whole bunch of material um, uh, for time's sake in battle. Another is when someone commits a breach of the covenant, breaks the covenant that uh, rises to the level of requiring execution. Well, then God commands the taking of the life of that person that's committed that level of a of covenantal breach. Um, another would be in protecting the vulnerable. And we find this in the law of Moses. We find this in the historical books. We find this in the prophets and in the, uh, the writings. It's all over the place. So sometimes not only does God allow, but God actually commands the taking of life in these certain circumstances. Battle, bre major breaches of the covenant that require execution and in protecting the vulnerable. In other texts, we're, we're even told uh, that, we are, that we are required to defend the needy and to deliver the vulnerable from danger. These poor people are in the classification, class, classification of the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, etc. And I've listed a number of, number of passages there where this theme uh, rises to the forefront. Feel free to study uh, these um, on your own as well. So we're told in uh, the um, Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, in certain instances in using these words other than ratzach, to commit murder, premeditated, on the innocent. Um, uh, we're told that we actually have a responsibility. It is expected of us uh, to um, perform these acts um, in defense of an individual or of the community. Now let's uh, move into the New Testament. Let's consider the Gospels first. <clears throat> Jesus' first act as Messiah was the turning of water into wine at Cana, and it's in John chapter 2. 
but another story, <clears throat> another story that is told in the, the second chapter of the Gospel of John is that in the early part of Jesus' ministry, he makes a trip to Jerusalem, he enters the temple, and he, um, it's usually called, cleanses the temple. Um, it says in John 2.15 that he made a scourge of cords and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and with the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. Jesus is using physical intervention here to right what he sees as a wrong that is negatively affecting the functioning of the temple and the worship of the people who come there to put themselves in the presence of God for purposes of sacrifice and worship. Um, it, some have, uh, have argued that here in this text, it never says that Jesus actually took that scourge of cords and hit anybody with it. I find that to be kind of, uh, it, first of all, you're reading into the scripture, and also this is reductionistic. The reality is some kind of way, using some kind of mode, Jesus drove these um, sellers of, uh, of sacrificial animals and um, uh, changers of, of money, drove them uh, using um, physical force out of the temple in order to purify the temple of their presence, uh, of their in influence, and to allow the true pure worship uh, of God. That's an interesting way to sort of start out a messianic ministry. Uh, there's a later temple cleansing uh, where some of, some of the details are similar. In uh, the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 21, you can tell because Matthew has 28 chapters, that this is a different temple cleansing, and it's taking place at the end of Jesus' ministry. In fact, Matthew 21 is describing the events of the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion, um, <clears throat> death, burial, and resurrection. So it says there that he cast out all of those who were buying and selling. Not only did he drive out like we have in John, but here he's throwing them out of the temple. In other words, uh, regardless of uh, how close Jesus came to actually physically whipping them with that, uh, uh, with that cord of, uh, that's, uh, of scourge, scourge cord, uh, he was forcing their exit from uh, the temple compound. He overturned another act of force, overturned the tables of the money changers. <clears throat> in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told in chapter 8 that Jesus um, meets a centurion. Um, a centurion is a Roman soldier. We would call him a, an, an army officer. And he had uh, at least 100 people under his direct command. And the centurion was the was the backbone of the Roman army as described in ancient Roman sources. And the whole Roman army um, marched and um, was uh, deployed um, on the backs of centurions. These people were the, 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 the very core of uh, the, the uh, Roman military uh, presence throughout the, the uh, Mediterranean basin in the time of Jesus. Uh, nevertheless, Jesus is willing to go to his home. He's willing to bring healing to this centurion's servant. Uh, and he says of this servant, never have I found such great faith in all of Israel. And so he's very complimentary of this person. And I use this as just one example of throughout the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Luke, who then continues, Luke does, continues this emphasis throughout the book of Acts that these people, these centurions are praised, they're lauded, they're held up as exemplary in their uh, attitudes and in their actions. And so the New Testament has very much uh, positive stuff to say about these military officers who are the backbone of the Roman army. <clears throat> When Jesus teaches about love, he teaches that we are to love 
the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Jesus says this is the greatest and foremost commandment. And then he says there's another one like it. He says that's love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says on these two commandments depend the entire law and the prophets. So what exactly is that love? That is providing for the needs of neighbor in the same way that you would provide for yourself. I would argue that it's not an expression of love to refrain from uh, physical intervention when someone is being molested or, or mugged or uh, raped or robbed, um, experiencing domestic violence. There's no argument that you can make from anywhere in scripture or from logic or even personal opinion that absolves us, those of us who want to place ourselves in obedience to God's word and live according to his commands and reflect his nature, there's, there's no way that we can absolve ourselves from the responsibility of stepping in when there is a need to be neighbor in those situations. Let's take a look at some passages from Paul. Um, Paul says in Romans chapter 13 that we should all be in sub subjection to the government because God is behind that. God is using the government as an instrument to bring peace, to bring protection um, from those that would do it harm. He says in verse 3, rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. And then he continues in verse 4, for it, the government, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, then be afraid, because it, the government, does not bear the sword in vain or for nothing. It's a minister of God and an avenger that brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Uh, Paul is affirming of the government's responsibility to bring peace, safety, and security to the members of a society. Similarly, when uh, <clears throat> Paul is talking about the Christian life in general, he will often use the word soldier as a, a figure of speech or a metaphor, but He's doing this always in a positive kind of way. It's a positive uh, figure of speech. And he's using the word soldier to illustrate the nature of the Christian life. In 1 Corinthians 9, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? He tells Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He even speaks of himself at the end of his life as having fought the good fight. So the language that Paul is using is not against or anti-military um, or uh, the position of soldier or a peacekeeper, a sheriff, a policeman, um, a, an FBI agent, um, or of a, um, a, 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 a lifeguard. A, um, someone who's taking care of uh, children on a playground, there is sometimes the need to physically intervene. I have fought the good fight. Paul even has as some of his great heroes of our faith. He talks about Epaphroditus as a soldier. He talks about Timothy himself as a soldier. He talks about Philemon, Archippus, and even himself as a soldier. And so in very positive, in glowing terms. Think back about Jesus and the centurion and all the way through the gospels and all the way through the book of Acts, we hear about centurions being set forward as being an exemplary figure. Then Paul picks up on this and he uses the term soldier in very positive um, uh, nuances, contexts. In his general instruction to all believers, Paul, going back to this 1 Timothy 5 passage, he says, if anyone doesn't provide for his own, and especially for his own household, and again, that word de uh, uh, refers to when you look at all the passages in the New Testament where that word is used, you look outside of the Bible in passages like Thucydides, who's writing an account of a, an ongoing war, his history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, 
means to take appropriate measures for the general welfare. And that includes everything from um, changing, uh, fixing problematic rules for society, all the way to food and raiment and, and uh, shelter, all the way to providing for physical safety and security. The remainder of the New Testament, when you look at passages like Hebrews 11, and this is one of the most impacting passages to me. I want to encourage you to spend time studying this for yourself because, again, I've sort of synopsized. But here in Hebrews 11, we have what has been called the Roll Call of Faith or the Faith Hall of Fame. These are the heroes of the faith. And you hear in Hebrews 11 people like Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, Samson, Samuel, David, all of these people functioned in military contexts. And according to the book of Hebrews, when chapter 11 is describing their actions, it says in verse 33, they subdued kingdoms. Verse 33 also, they enforced justice. Verse 34, they were made strong from their own weakness. In verse 34, most explicitly, it says they became mighty in war, even in verse 34, putting foreign armies to flight. And listen to what Hebrews, just listen to this, what Hebrews 11 says about all of these famous mighty warriors of the Bible. All of these, verse 39 says, having gained approval through their faith. And so we don't have this radical separation, this radical um, departure where, yes, when they're men of peace, God approves of them. But when they function as people who are trying to bring deliverance like Abraham did to his nephew Lot, um, they were approved of in both of those contexts, according to the New Testament in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. At the conclusion of human history, and we're fast forwarding now to the end of the New Testament and the book of Revelation, we're told that King Jesus is going to return um, victoriously from heaven, and he's going to be armed with a two-edged sword in order that he might smite the nations with it, Revelation 19, and that uh, he will make war against them with the sword. Uh, so from the beginning to the end of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament alike. There is no that was then, this is now in the Bible. You just simply can't find it. If you want to adopt that as your approach, as your worldview, as the way that you look at the world, well, that was back in the olden days, but now, you know, we're living in an enlightened time. This is a, you know, thousand points of light and uh, a, uh, a new and improved world. That you, that's, that's your choice. The Bible, however, is presenting a very consistent God a, a very consistent command to God's people. Um, and there, there is no that was then, this is now approach or worldview presented in Scripture. You can also um, kind of get rid of this idea, well, that was what happened in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, now we meet, meet, we meet a forgiving, compassionate, patient, merciful, um, meek and mild, peace-loving Jesus. No, it's in both Testaments, we find this beautifully balanced perspective on the nature of God. I, I, I hope that you're able to embrace it. God is neither a warmonger, nor is he a peacenik. He has, um, uh, he is a, a perfectly, is perfectly balanced within his being. He's calling on us to imitate that balance. Also, there is no vengeful, warlike God of the Old Testament versus the Jesus who comes bringing only uh, peace and, and love and forgiveness. Those, th that would be uh, taking a position that is focusing exclusively on one set of text to the exclusion and to the detriment, to the hurt of another set of texts. God's nature does not reflect one extreme or the other. 
what's interesting is that God is not asking us to reflect one extreme or the other either. As we represent him, he's calling on us to represent in a balanced and in a, a contextually appropriate way both of these aspects of his nature, God of peace, God of war, parentally, God of discipline, God of nurture. Um, this is the nature of the God that we serve, the nature of the God that is revealed in scripture. You know, God and, and, and his word are really realistic about the state of this world, its fallen nature, the, the fallen nature of all of the people who are in it. Um, God is very much in touch with his world. He's very much aware that there is evil in this world, and he allows for, in fact, I think we've seen in, in, in a number of scriptures, he commands that this evil be opposed in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it has to be opposed by force. God calls those that have, uh, are, have chosen to follow him, to, to cast their lot with him, to yoke themselves to him, um, uh, to follow him. He's called us to live lives that are holistic and that are integrated, not lives that are filled with bits and pieces, internally, internal inconsistencies, all kinds of inner conflict, uh, and only part-time devotion and obedience. God has not called us to be um, always peacemakers and then to set aside our Christianity, to set aside our service to God and love for neighbor, to go and then serve as a policeman or as a sheriff or as a soldier. Instead, God has called us to live out those callings under his lordship, um, uh, exercising restraint, absolutely, always going with, with other alternatives when it's at all possible. And yet God has called us to be that, that godly, obedient um, uh, Christian uh, serviceman or uh, sheriff or FBI agent or parent or uh, protector on the playground. That's what God has called us to be, to live these lives, not as broken up bits and pieces kind of people, but living these consistent lives of, of obedience to him uh, in submission to his word. Um, I, I trust that, that this uh, survey, uh, albeit quick and, and comprehensive, uh, will help at least uh, encourage you, spur you on, to um, approach scripture yourself. Do this, do that, that heavy lifting of studying this stuff out for yourself. Maybe use this, uh, a, a, uh, this study that we've done, not as an end all, but rather as a jumping off point. Um, go back to it, rewatch the video, um, make use of the, of, of the PowerPoint to do your own study, to weigh this out, to place this before God in prayer and ask God to help you to live that more integrated, more holistic, more co uh, uh, consistent life that he has called uh, us uh, to live. Um, we've put on the uh, website and will be on Facebook uh, an article that I wrote that goes into even greater detail. Please feel free to use that as a starting point, as a study sheet to do your own study. Um, and uh, the title is, is on the screen there in front of you. What we're hoping is that every time that we come together like this, together around God's word, to give careful consideration, not to things that don't matter, uh, there's no really no real reason to, to study that, but to pick up on some of the, the more difficult issues and to wrestle with them, to wrangle with them, um, to take into consideration the full counsel of God, um, everything that God has to say about that particular situation or problem or issue, and then to come to grips as the Spirit guides us to come to grips with 
a, uh, a place where we can stand with integrity and where we can stand with, with, with love for God and neighbor and where we can stand in a biblical balance that's healthy for us and healthy for our society. This is exactly what we want. We don't want to be people of extremes. We don't want to be people who are radical on one side or the other, but straight down the middle, right in the sweet spot, the, the fat part of the bat, we want to be right there uh, where the nature of God is, where the, the nature of God the Father in the Old Testament is, and where the nature of God the Son, God revealed in the flesh, where he is, and then what he's called us to be and do in the rest of scripture. I trust that the Lord will have met you today in this, and that this will serve as, as an encouragement to you that this is a God who's legitimate, and he can be served, and he is a God who is consistent and real um, and in touch with his world. Um, this is a God that I feel like that we can approach and that we can serve with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. Look, guys, despite the, the current situation, despite the difficulties, that's still a possibility, not in our own strength, but by his power that works mightily within us. That's our heritage. He's made that provision for us. Let's walk that out this week. God bless you richly as you serve him, as you represent him in your world. Uh, to the best of your ability, empowered by his spirit this week. God bless.